Welcome to NTD News Today. I'm Kevin Hogan. Let's take a look at our top stories. New details emerging about the school shooting in Texas where a gunman killed 19 children and two adults. Parents waited into the night for children to be identified. Four states held primary elections on Tuesday. We take a look at the projected winners. The Justice Department fines mining giant Glencore over a billion dollars for bribery and market manipulation. They say Glencore made hundreds of millions of dollars by bribing officials. The Atlantic hurricane season starts this week. This year, more storms than normal are predicted. But is the U.S. ready and are Americans prepared? At least 19 children and two adults are dead after a gunman opened fire yesterday at an elementary school in Texas. Many more were injured before law enforcement shot and killed the suspect. And today's Jessica Beatty has more. Just two days before the last day of school, a teenage gunman turned this elementary school in Uvalde, Texas into a crime scene. A school official called for prayer support. My heart was broken today. We're a small community and we will need your prayers to get us through this. Among those killed, according to her aunt, Ava Moreles, a fourth grade teacher and educator for 17 years, and 10-year-old Mary Jo Garza, whose father confirmed her death. Authorities say the suspected gunman, identified as 18-year-old Salvador Ramos, shot his grandmother before driving to Robb Elementary School. Ramos was killed by police officers responding to the scene. At this point, the investigation is leading uh, to tell us that the, the suspect uh, did act alone uh, during this heinous crime. Ramos reportedly posted this picture to Instagram three days before the shooting. Democrat Texas State Senator Roland Gutierrez said the suspect legally bought the guns. They went to high school here in Uvalde and uh, unfortunately uh, on his 18th birthday he bought those two uh, assault rifles. Police were seen carrying similar guns out of the school Tuesday. President Biden's ordered flags to be flown at half staff for the victims. Biden calling for common sense gun laws. As a nation, we have to ask, when in God's name are we going to stand up to the gun lobby? We have to make it clear to every elected official in this country, it's time to act. Democratic U.S. Senator Chris Murphy implored colleagues to act to combat gun violence. Before his election to the Senate, he represented the district where the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting took place. Our kids are living in fear every single time they set foot in the classroom because they think they're going to be next. What are we doing? Republican Senator Ted Cruz says the immediate solution for many Democrat lawmakers is to try to restrict the constitutional rights of law-abiding citizens. That doesn't work. It's not effective. It doesn't prevent crime. We know what does prevent crime, which is going after felons and fugitives and those with serious mental illness, arresting them, prosecuting them when they try to illegally buy firearms. Authorities are still searching for a motive. Jessica Beatty, NTD News. Democratic lawmakers such as Representative Ruben Gallego are responding to the Texas shooting. They're saying laws need to be passed to prevent these kinds of tragedies. Next, we hear from a gun expert on what steps can be taken to prevent something like this from happening again. Joining us now is Brady Kirkpatrick, who's the editor of GunMade. Thanks for taking the time, Brady. Thanks for having me, Kevin. Let's start with the horrible tragedy in Uvalde, Texas. As someone who gives advice to people on guns, what steps do you think need to be taken to prevent something like this from happening again? You know, Kevin, first, my condolences to all the families and children involved. It's extremely sad being in the gun industry to see, you know, firearms used in the wrong way. You know, over the last 24 hours, we have seen a, you know, a large spike in gun sales. And it's never, you know, good to see that your business is doing well amidst a tragedy. But I would say the biggest, you know, the biggest concern we can look at addressing in the gun space is figuring out, you know, how do we find a better way to make sure the people, the bad people don't get a hold of these guns? And what's happening, I mean, what they're saying yesterday is that the, the kid stole the gun from his grandmother. And, you know, essentially, does that come down to proper storage of guns? Does it come down to mental health? They're still investigating that. But I would say the biggest thing we could look at, you know, promoting is getting a much better um, law enforced to promote gun safety and gun storage. A lot of people are easily able to obtain guns. They're able to obtain guns with not with a lack of proper training. 
Um, there's no way an 18 year old should have been able to go in, take his grandma's firearm and go shoot up a school. Um, there had to have been a lack of proper storage, you know, was there mental health involved? Who knows, but there definitely needs to be a change in the gun space where, you know, it's, it's more difficult for children, especially, you know, minors to get a hold of guns. And in response, President Biden is calling for common sense gun laws following the mass shooting at the elementary school. Do you think this is justified? I do believe it's justified. I mean, we've seen far too many mass shootings in schools over the past few years, and there has been very little change. So I do agree that there does need to be some change regarding the common common sense laws. But um, it seems that every time there's a mass shooting, there isn't too much done. So I don't know what the solution is, Kevin, but I do agree that there does need to be something switched up in the gun industry. Yeah, something certainly needs to be done. Now, a gun rights group, the Gun Owners of America, is accusing the ATF, accusing the Bureau of an illegal gun registry. What do you make of this? Well, I agree the GOA is is in the right. You know, the ATF does have almost a billion records of firearm purchases and sales. The ATF argues that everything they have stored is only a photocopy of um, it's essentially a digital photo of the records and they're not sharing it with anyone else. It can only be used, you know, if law enforcement requests those records to identify where the guns were sold, purchased, how they got to the shooter. But what GOA, what the Gun Owners of America is arguing is that they are pretty much handing this data off to other organizations, other agencies, and it's being used in an illegal way. Now, my personal belief is that, you know, regardless of who has the data, who has the records, someone is, it's getting into someone's hands that shouldn't be viewing it. I mean, I personally believe that there's a lot of corruption going on with the gun space. The ATF seems to be a pretty um, questionable organization. I mean, we're going to talk more about what they're doing with the JSD supply company, but um, I would say, you know, my biggest concern is not necessarily that they are giving that information away, but it's more so what are they going to plan to do with it in the future? Brady Kirkpatrick at GunMade, thank you so much for your analysis. Thank you, Kevin. The ATF declined to comment on the secret and unannounced policy changes, but the Bureau did refer to Biden's order to crack down on so-called ghost guns. It says these types of guns can be purchased online without a background check and can be assembled into a gun in 30 minutes. Entity hasn't received a comment from ATF on the illegal gun registry. The results are in. Georgia, Alabama, Arkansas, and Texas held primary elections Tuesday. Let's find out who the projected winners are. Entity's Jeremy Sandberg has the story. Incumbent Governor Brian Kemp is the winner of Georgia's Republican gubernatorial primary. Kemp won with a majority vote of 73% over his Trump-endorsed opponent, former U.S. Senator David Perdue, according to projections from Edison Research. Tonight, because of your support, Georgia Republicans went to the ballot box and overwhelmingly endorsed four more years of our vision for this great state. Perdue conceded to Kemp shortly after polls closed on Tuesday. It looks pretty obvious right now. I just called the governor, and I congratulate him. And I want you to do the same thing. Right now, what we've got to do is face the reality that Bonnie and I made a decision when we decided to do this, that we trusted the people of Georgia. Kemp will face Democratic nominee Stacey Abrams in November's general election. Let's prove them wrong again and go two for O on November the 8th. Thank you all, and God bless you. Let's keep chopping, everybody. Thank you very much. Kemp beat Abrams in 2018. He paints her as a far-left radical who only sees the governor position as a stepping stone to the White House. It's my belief, it's my belief that together, together, we're going to make sure Stacy's Road to Pennsylvania Avenue stops right here in the Peach State. Abrams ran unopposed in Georgia's Democratic primary. I have listened to Republicans for the last six months attack me, but they've done nothing to attack the challenges facing Georgia. They've done nothing to articulate their plans for the future of Georgia. Trump endorsed Herschel Walker as the projected winner in Georgia's Republican U.S. Senate primary and will face Democratic Senator Raphael Warnock in November. Incumbent Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger defeated Trump-backed Congressman Jody Heiss in Georgia's Republican Secretary of State primary. 
Raffensperger will face the winner of the Democratic Secretary of State primary runoff, likely B. Nguyen, who had a solid lead over her opponents but not enough to win outright. Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene won the Republican House primary in Georgia's 14th Congressional District, and Marcus Flowers won on the Democratic side. Georgia's newly redrawn District 7 has Representative Lucy McBath as the projected winner of the Democratic House primary. On the Republican side, Michael Corbin and Mark Gonsalves advanced to a runoff. In Alabama, Representative Mo Brooks will face Katie Britt in a GOP Senate primary runoff election on June 21st to potentially replace retiring Republican Senator Richard Shelby. The winner will first have to beat Will Boyd, who won the Democratic nomination. Incumbent Governor Kay Ivey beat a crowd of Republican candidates to win the Alabama GOP gubernatorial primary. She will face either Yolanda Flowers or Malika Sanders Fortier, who were headed to a runoff. Arkansas's Republican primary for U.S. Senate has incumbent John Bozeman as their projected winner with 58% of the vote, and Natalie James as the Democratic nominee with 54%. Sarah Huckabee Sanders, Trump's former White House press secretary, is projected to win the GOP nomination for governor of Arkansas. I think it's important to make sure we have strong conservative governors that are stepping up, holding the line, and pushing back against the bad policy coming out of Washington. And in Texas, Attorney General Ken Paxton defeated Land Commissioner George P. Bush in the Republican primary runoff and will defend his seat against Democratic nominee Rochelle Garza in November. Representative Henry Cuellar of Texas faced progressive challenger Jessica Cisneros in the Democratic Party runoff for the 28th District. Cuellar has declared victory, but Cisneros says the race is too close to call. The winner will face Republican nominee Cassie Garcia. The political environment has grown increasingly favorable to Republicans in the run-up to November's midterms. According to a Reuters opinion poll completed Tuesday, President Joe Biden's approval rating has fallen to 36 percent, the lowest level of his presidency, reflecting voter worries over rising inflation. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. A special election for Minnesota's first congressional district was also held on Tuesday. A House seat was left vacant after Republican Representative Jim Hagedorn passed away earlier this year. Jeff Ettinger won the Democratic primary, while Brad Finstad is the projected winner on the Republican side. An appeals court has temporarily blocked the January 6th committee from receiving records from the Republican National Committee. The records are related to fundraising leading up to the day of the Capitol breach. A federal judge ruled earlier that a subpoena issued to RNC marketing vendor Salesforce was legitimate. The court is considering an emergency appeal from the RNC. The company Salesforce was used by the RNC and former President Donald Trump's 2020 campaign. The investigating committee says the subpoena is needed to see if the campaign used the Salesforce platform to, quote, disseminate false statements about the 2020 election. In a statement, the RNC called the subpoena unlawful. It noted that the information requested about the internal activities of the Republican Party and millions of its supporters is, quote, completely unrelated to the attack on the Capitol. Swiss-based mining giant Glencore must pay over a billion dollars in penalties for bribery and price manipulation. The Justice Department says Glencore agreed to plead guilty to charges in two separate criminal cases. Here are the details. Attorney General Merrick Garland announced Tuesday that mining giant Glencore has agreed to pay around $1.1 billion in criminal fines. This concludes a five-year investigation by the Justice Department. Glencore pleaded guilty to charges in two separate criminal cases. In connection with the first plea, Glencore has agreed to pay approximately $700 million in penalties for its decade-long scheme to bribe foreign officials in seven different countries. The second plea involves Glencore's U.S. commodities trading arm, Glencore Limited, which engaged in a scheme to manipulate fuel oil prices at two of the busiest commercial shipping ports in the United States over the course of eight years. The Justice Department says Glencore made over $270 million by bribing foreign officials and over $140 million by manipulating commodity prices. Garland says this is the department's largest criminal enforcement action to date for a commodity price manipulation conspiracy in oil markets. Glencore paid over $100 million in bribes to government officials in Brazil, Nigeria, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Venezuela, The bribery scheme here spanned the globe. Glencore paid bribes to secure oil contracts. Glencore paid bribes to avoid government audits. 
Glencore paid bribes to judges to make lawsuits disappear. In a statement on Tuesday, Glencore says it cooperated with authorities and has made substantial investment to enhance its ethics and compliance program. As hurricane season nears, the message for millions is to be prepared. The 2022 Atlantic season starts next week, and the official forecast calls for three to six major hurricanes. That's above normal for the seventh year in a row. Here's the latest. We must be smart, we must be safe, and we must be prepared. New York Mayor Eric Adams recognizing 2022 marks a decade since Superstorm Sandy killed 44 people in the city and just months since Ida's furious flooding took the lives of 13, many of them trapped in their basements. No one is immune from the effects of these tropical storms. The time to get ready is now. The 2022 Atlantic hurricane forecast out today from NOAA calls for an above normal season with 14 to 21 named storms, six to 10 of them hurricanes and three to six of those storms becoming major hurricanes. Whether we face three storms or 30 storms, um, I'd like you to know that FEMA, we are ready for this hurricane season. Forecasters today stressed with more and more storms battering wider areas of the country, scientists have made significant strides over the past decade predicting cones of uncertainty. Our improved track forecast has allowed us to more accurately pinpoint the area most at risk, which reduces the size of areas that may need to evacuate when a hurricane threatens. The Atlantic hurricane season officially starts next Wednesday. This year's prediction marks the seventh season in a row with an above average number of storms. The call to action today for millions of families to research their hurricane risk, find evacuation zones and realize their risk is growing. The U.S. Energy Secretary is in Louisiana to announce the release of oil from the country's strategic reserve. The department is taking bids on the millions of barrels that are being released. The president has decided that it's, he's going to use the biggest tool that we have in our arsenal, which is the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, to release one million barrels per day for the next six months so that we can help to do our part to stabilize the, the mismatch between supply and demand globally. America's Strategic Petroleum Reserve is a collection of underground salt caverns in Texas and Louisiana. They can hold more than 700 millions of barrels of oil, but they are not currently full. The White House announced in March the release of one million barrels of oil per day for the next six months. Biden will also ask Congress to penalize oil and gas companies that lease public land but aren't producing energy. The administration hopes that tapping the petroleum reserve will buy time and tamp down gasoline prices until domestic producers can boost output. The reserve held over 560 million barrels last week, down from more than 650 million barrels in mid-2021. A company at the heart of the baby formula shortage says it plans to restart its plant next week. Tuesday, Abbott Nutrition said it will restart production at its facility in Sturgis, Michigan on June 4th. But the company does not expect the first batches of new formula to be available until around June 30th. Abbott shut down its plant in Sturgis back in February after FDA investigators found bacteria in several areas inside the plant. This led to a nationwide recall of its baby formula products. The agency and Abbott have since reached an agreement on the steps the company needed to take to restart production. Abbott says it does have a limited amount of formula it produced before the shutdown. They plan to make that formula available free of charge to families that need it. According to the company, the products have undergone additional testing and are safe to distribute. And coming up, a man who has made a 15-year career out of impersonating law enforcement officers was arrested in Maryland. He's been arrested in multiple states. And scientists are using a drone in the Gulf of Alaska to study the chemistry of the ocean. The first-of-its-kind drone has a sensor that measures the ocean's carbon dioxide levels. We'll have more for you in just a minute right here on NTD News. A judge has awarded more money to the owners of condos that were part of a Florida building that collapsed last year. Tuesday, the judge approved a $96 million settlement for owners with units in the Champlain Tower South condominium. The original settlement was $83 million, but the judge increased it by another $13 million to bring it up to the value of the building's appraisal. 
98 people were killed after the Champlain Tower South buildings collapsed last June. Tuesday's settlement with the unit owners is separate from the lawsuit filed by the victims' families. They reached a preliminary agreement of over $990 million in their wrongful death settlement earlier this month. Nineteen people have been indicted in a complex money laundering scheme. It conspired to move millions of dollars in drug proceeds from Colombian cartels through U.S. banks. Federal prosecutors say the charges are the result of a five-year investigation into a Colombian organization. Massachusetts U.S. Attorney Rachel Rollins says those charged played a variety of roles, including drug suppliers and dollar purchasers. Authorities say they laundered at least $6 million through the U.S. banking system. More than three tons of seized cocaine has been traced back to the money laundering organization. A Maryland man is facing federal charges for impersonating a U.S. marshal. The Department of Justice says this is, isn't Antoine Tuxen's first time impersonating law enforcement. He's been allegedly doing it for 15 years. He was charged in 2006 for impersonating an officer in West Virginia. Those charges were dropped. Then three years later, Tuxen was arrested in Washington, D.C. on similar charges. In this latest incident, the DOJ says Tuxen attempted to arrest two patrons who disputed their bill. This while he was working as an armed security guard at a Maryland restaurant. He falsely said he was a U.S. Marshal to justify his unlawful possession of a firearm. Tuxen had a co-conspirator, Nijia Rich, who posed as his supervisor to the police. She was also arrested and charged with impersonating a federal officer. Tuxen is in jail awaiting trial. Rich was released under the supervision of the U.S. pretrial services. The water level in Lake Mead, the nation's largest reservoir, dropped below 1,050 feet elevation for the first time last week, revealing more surprises under the surface, like a number of boats that have resurfaced. The man who took these pictures says there are dozens of boats in the area, but he only photographed a few. The reservoir's dropping water levels are a great concern. It provides water to 25 million people in Arizona, Nevada, California, and Mexico. It's currently operating in a Tier 1 shortage, which began in January. If levels continue to drop, it will impact agriculture and municipal water use on a much broader scale. Researchers in Alaska are measuring carbon dioxide levels in coastal waters with the help of an underwater drone. The scientists want to better understand the ocean's chemistry and use the data to study what's known as ocean acidification. Here are the details. In the waters of Alaska's Resurrection Bay, scientists are waiting to collect an underwater sea glider. It's believed to be the first ever drone with an industry standardized sensor that measures carbon dioxide levels in the ocean. Andrew McDonald is one of the researchers on the mission. He explains that when humans are producing carbon dioxide by burning fossil fuels, the gas is also exchanging with the ocean and making its way down into the ocean. That changes the chemistry of the water that's uh, that's behind me here and around the entire globe. And so that's important because the organisms that build shells, for example, uh, and rely on a specific chemistry, they, uh, they may be affected by those changes in chemistry. The process is known as ocean acidification. The underwater drone can dive close to 3,300 feet in remote parts of the ocean and go on missions that last weeks. The data it collects will provide a baseline to better understand the ocean's chemistry and study ocean acidification. And this is why we um, had the idea that we should add um, this very um, accurate carbon dioxide sensor onto a glider and we can send it out in winter and it can measure everywhere throughout the water column and we can get much more data. The more data you have, the better you understand the natural variability of the system. Besides CO2, researchers also fitted the drone with another sensor to measure methane. They want to study places that release or are prone to releasing methane into the water column and also into the atmosphere. So it's really, it's the next step tool of of moving chemistry, ocean chemistry into the robotics realm where we can collect big data sets and, and integrate those and understand much more about what's going on in the ocean than we have been before. Researchers say they would like to have a fleet of underwater drones operating in Alaska waters and elsewhere. Still to come, in a village recaptured by the Ukrainian troops in the Kharkiv region, residents of two shattered buildings share the hardships of Russia's invasion. Find out more after the short break.
Secure, the true solution for your digital privacy and security. Secure is a private and secure messaging and email solution hosted in Switzerland using military-grade encryption and Swiss privacy laws, giving you true privacy. Secure is 100% private and does not collect or sell any of your personal data. Secure's Helix technology connects you securely to our Swiss servers without the need of a VPN, guaranteeing privacy and security for all your communications. Secure Messenger doesn't require your phone number or any personal data that hackers target. Chat by Invites allows you to chat privately and securely with anyone outside of your secure network without the need for others to download Secure. Secure Send offers you a private and secure way to email anyone outside of Secure. You won't find this level of privacy or security on any other email or instant messaging application. Visit secure.com. Regain and protect your privacy today. Oh, hey, doesn't it feel like there's communists everywhere? In fact, the Chinese Communist Party has been subverting America from every angle. So whether it's compromising our politicians, controlling Hollywood, manipulating Wall Street, or infiltrating our schools, they have stopped at nothing to take down America. And I believe that in order for us to not become like China, we need citizens who know the truth. So go on over to getepic.com, stay informed with a subscription to the Epic Times, and you will get instant access to this infographic. Hi, I'm Smokey Bear, and I made an assistant to help you out, because only you can prevent wildfires. Hey, Assistant Smokey Bear, call me Papa Bear, because I'm grilling up dinner. <laughs> do you get it? Yes, good job. So, what should I do with all these coals? Don't just toss them out. Put them in a metal container, because those embers can start a wildfire. I understand. The stakes are high. Ha, 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 ha. See, Smokey thinks I'm funny. Russia now has a list of more than 900 Americans who are banned from entering the country. The list includes many American military and government officials, as well as President Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris. Mike Pompeo, who was Secretary of State under former President Donald Trump, was also listed. Some American activists, CEOs, and celebrities are included. Actor Morgan Freeman and filmmaker Rob Reiner made the list. In 2017, Reiner founded the Committee to Investigate Russia, and Freeman was featured in one of the committee's videos. The release by the Russian Foreign Ministry accuses them of spreading Russia phobia. The Colombian Armed Forces are sending a team to train the Ukrainian military on demining operations. That's what the Colombian Ministry of Defense said in a statement. The team of 11 military engineers will be deployed to an unnamed neighboring NATO country where the training will be carried out. The announcement comes after U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin invited his Colombian counterpart to join the contact group for the defense of Ukraine. Colombia's defense minister said the country is committed to the values of freedom and human rights and is, quote, making a concrete contribution as a member and global partner country of NATO. Next, a first-hand account of the hardships of Russia's invasion. The following comments come from residents of two shattered tower blocks inside a village recaptured by the Ukrainian troops in the Kharkiv region. They discuss problems from relentless artillery fire and exploding shells to the lack of power and running water. NTD's Andrew Thomas has the details. Inside Vera Filipova's home, blackened pots litter the messy kitchen and rumpled comforters sit on unkempt beds. They cook outside on an open fire. Fueled by shattered wood they pull from destroyed homes. Corrugated cement sheeting blown off a rooftop shields the flames from rain. I got very scared on May 9th. It was real hell. The shrapnel flew everywhere. The windows were blown out. What a nightmare. Across the lot in the second block, it's a different world. Larissa and six other residents tend neat gardens of roses, peonies, carrots, and scallions. When the war got started, we were busy with agriculture. We bought gas to share with everyone. We prepared meals with the neighbors, using what we had in our basements. We used only our produce because humanitarian aid did not arrive. The shops were destroyed in the first days. It was very difficult. We were scared and didn't understand what was going on. We had to learn how to live anew. The residents here share the humanitarian aid they receive. 
when shelling eases, Valdemir Evchenko and his wife venture to an abandoned home to make meals on a brick grill. We are preparing meals for everyone the whole time. As I said, at 8 a.m. we prepare tea, then lunch at 12 p.m., super some porridge. I am responsible for heating the cooking area all on my own. None can forget being jarred awake one night earlier this month when a Russian missile plunged into a nearby house. The explosion blew out the home's walls and roof, shattered windows, and shredded walls. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. North Korea launched three ballistic missiles off its east coast on Wednesday local time. That's according to South Korea's military. It marks the first weapons fire in about two weeks and the 17th round this year. According to South Korea's Joint Chiefs of Staff, the first missile appeared to be an intercontinental ballistic missile. A second unidentified missile appears to have failed mid-flight, and the third missile was a short-range ballistic missile. These tests come on the heels of U.S. President Joe Biden's first presidential trip to Asia. In response, the U.S. and South Korea launched missiles off the Korean peninsula into the sea to demonstrate their joint military strength. South Korean President Yoon suk Yeol says his country stands ready for any acts of provocation. Yoon also convened a National Security Council meeting to discuss heightened tensions in the region. Separately, the South says North Korea appears to have conducted an experiment with a detonation device in preparation for its seventh nuclear test. British lawmakers on Tuesday condemned the Chinese Communist Party's human rights violations. That's as leaked police files reveal details of abuses that minorities in Xinjiang face. The release of the files include thousands of photographs of detainees and a shoot-to-guilt policy for those trying to escape. It comes as the United Nations Commissioner for Human Rights arrived in China. And today's Jane Worrell brings us more on this. As the UN's human rights chief, Michelle Bachelet, arrived in China, files allegedly leaked from a Chinese police database reveal further disturbing violations against Uyghurs held in internment camps in Xinjiang. Details of the files were published by the BBC and include thousands of images of detainees and protocols for guarding the camps, including a shoot-to-kill policy for those trying to escape, as well as speeches by senior officials showing their demands to treat Uyghurs like dangerous criminals. In response, Foreign Secretary Liz Truss said in a statement that the UK is committed to holding China to account. Earlier, MP Nisrat Ghani raised the issue in Parliament. The reason why this evidence was on the BBC this morning, because it coincides with a UN visit, the visit of Ms Bachelet, who is the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights. It's a rare visit, but unfortunately, the Chinese Communist Party have said that because of COVID, it's a closed-loop visit. It's in a bubble. So they will absolutely control who she sees and who she meets. Another example of the UN being bullied by the CCP. Does the minister share my concerns that this UN visit and any report produced will deny the absolute truth what's happening against the Uyghur people, which is the genocide at the hands of the CCP? While ministers say they haven't called the treatment of Uyghurs a genocide because of that policy, MPs passed a motion last April declaring that the Chinese regime is committing a genocide against Uyghur Muslims and other minorities in Xinjiang has committed genocide. The independent UK-based Uyghur tribunal ruled last December that China has committed genocide against the Uyghurs. It also found the Chinese regime guilty of crimes against humanity, including torture, sexual violence and forced sterilisation. There are calls from MPs for the government to do more, including issuing more sanctions on Chinese officials and to reduce the UK's dependency on the Chinese economy. As for Bachelet's visit, Liz Truss, the Foreign Secretary, said that she's following it closely and that if full access isn't granted, it would only serve to highlight China's attempt to hide the truth of its actions in Xinjiang. Jane Werrell, NTD News, London. The U.S. State Department is questioning a move by the United Nations amid reports of internment camps in China. The U.N.'s High Commissioner for Human Rights is currently visiting the country on a six-day mission. On Tuesday, State Department spokesman Ned Price expressed concerns about the trip and called out China over images of the alleged internment camps. 
based on our understanding of the planned uh, restrictions that uh, she will be subjected to during the visit, uh, we have no expectation that the PRC will grant the necessary access required to conduct a complete, unmanipulated assessment of the human rights environment uh, in Xinjiang. Price called the UN trip a mistake, in part due to the restrictions China has put on the visit. China has long held back the fact-finding mission led by the UN's human rights chief, Michelle Bachelet. Her trip is the first to China by a UN High Commissioner for Human Rights since 2005. Bachelet's six-day visit is focused on allegations of abuses against Muslim minorities in the northwestern region of Xinjiang, but rights groups fear it will help whitewash the clampdown that the U.S. calls genocide. Almost a dozen groundbreaking new films are playing in New York City this week, welcoming back a beloved film festival for the first time since the pandemic. NTD's Tiffany Meyer was on the scene at the movie premiere of a new animation film. The Human Rights Watch Film Festival is returning to New York after a two-year break. Supporting human rights, it just seems so awesome, especially in New York City, too. We're here at Lincoln Center at the Human Rights Watch Film Festival, where we're about to watch Eternal Spring. Let's see who we can grab before that. We're very interested in this film because of the artistic dimension of it. Eternal Spring is a stunning new animation film which tells the story of brave members of Falun Gong or Falun Dafa, a spiritual practice with 100 million practitioners around the world. It was really good. I loved how unique the animation was. You could tell they really put a lot of passion and care into it. The massive group was tortured in China. Many were even killed by the Chinese Communist Party for simply believing in their faith. This was like something that I've never had any information on before. People are so affected by it, but it's not world-renowned and no one's talking about it. And so I just kind of want this to get out there and have people see this um, film. I met up with director and producer Jason Loftus right before the movie's U.S. premiere. We talked about what inspired him to make this movie, which took nearly six years to bring to fruition. I took my lead really from the people that I was seeing come out of China. And what I witnessed was people who were willing to sacrifice a lot more than I was facing in order to be able to speak the truth in the face of injustice. And I just figured if we don't do the same with the freedom um, that we have here, then, you know, we may regret that in the long run. So I think it's important that we use the freedom we have to speak up. And fortunately, I think there's a lot of people who agree with that. Loftus is also the CEO of his own gaming studio, producing video games that have grown in popularity worldwide, including China. But while producing the Eternal Spring movie, the Chinese government put immense pressure on his business, trying to stop him from releasing the film. So the video game I mentioned was being published by Tencent in China, which is a large media company. But in the midst of making these films, uh, the, the Chinese government contacted Tencent and forced them to cut ties with my company. But Loftus and his team persisted, releasing the film anyway. Sold out tonight at the Lincoln Center, which is really exciting. I'm looking forward to it. I also spoke to the comic book artist behind the movie, as well as one of the main characters, Da Xiong. He's worked on big comic book projects, including Star Wars and the Justice League. There are always people in this world who need to stand up and do the right thing, just like the sacrifices by the group of heroes depicted in this movie. The movie has already won many awards after premiering in Canada and Europe, on its way to becoming a global success even without the Chinese market. Go to the theater, <laughs> see this movie. It's a very powerful story. I highly recommend everyone seeing it. We just watched Eternal Spring. It was truly beautiful and touching. If you get the chance, come check it out. This was just the first stop on their U.S. tour, so there's lots still coming. Tiffany Meyer, NTD News, New York. To watch the new animated film, Eternal Spring, you can still catch it at select theaters across the U.S., including California, New Jersey, and Oklahoma, or stream it online. In Albania, the traditional craft of wool hat making endures thanks to a family that has passed on the skill set from generation to generation. Entity's Andrew Thomas has the details. In the ancient Albanian town of Kruja, a small shop in the old bazaar is making caps called Selesh. They're not as popular as they used to be, but the traditional craft associated with them is still here. The Guni family has proudly passed on the handcraft from generation to generation. 
We've continued to preserve this family tradition with my father, grandfather, great-grandfather, who have worked with this craft. We still preserve it. Numir Rakaj is an ethnographic expert from Kruya's National Ethnographic Museum. He shows the felt hats and tools used to make them. There are not a lot of people doing this kind of job, you know, as a, or this kind of hand, uh, handcrafts, you know. But in the old bazaar, is, we are lucky to have a person who makes the traditional hat, following the old tradition, and with, with his son in his own workshop, he still preserved the old tradition of making the national hat. Many machine manufactured hats come from China and Turkey, making Guni's quest to save the tradition more difficult. Felt hats are part of our cultural heritage. It is a handcraft which luckily has survived to our days. We've managed to preserve it with many sacrifices. Kruya offers many tourist attractions, and these traditional hats continue to be a draw. This is a great value for Kruya, and it's a great value for Albania, for entire Albania. And it needs to be promoted because uh, people need to know and also to see how really was a handcraft, you know, and how to preserve the old traditions, how important it is to preserve it. Albania's tourism started to significantly increase two years ago, before the pandemic. Albania attracted 6.4 million tourists in 2019, when tourism accounted for about 9% of gross domestic product. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. Authorities say a chihuahua puppy shot through the neck with an arrow in Southern California was expected to survive after veterinarians removed the projectile. A woman reported to 911 that she found the wounded dog in a neighborhood near Desert Hot Springs after hearing it screaming. That's according to a statement from Riverside County Animal Services. A sheriff's deputy picked up the four-month-old female and transferred it to an animal services officer who brought the puppy to the Coachella Valley Animal Campus in Thousand Palms. Veterinary staff determined that the arrow did not strike the puppy's vital arteries and it was removed. They, they will continue to treat the puppy and work on finding her a home. They say the puppy remains affectionate. Spanish divers freed an almost 40-foot-long humpback whale. It was entangled in an illegal drift net off an island in Spain. A marine biologist says it's only the third time a humpback whale has been sighted in the area. The weakened whale was spotted by a ship about three miles off Mallorca. A local aquarium's marine rescue center sprang into action to help. They discovered the whale completely trapped in fishnet. It could not even open its mouth. After the first attempts to cut the net from a boat failed, divers plunged into the sea to remove the mesh with their knives in a daring 45-minute operation. The owner of a diving center explained that for the first 10 seconds they went down to help, the whale was nervous, but says the whale realized they were there to help and then relaxed. After it was cut free, the whale rested a while to regain her strength and then gave what looked like a little thank you sign to rescuers before swimming off. It's going to be the world's fastest and longest range purpose-built business jet. That's how plane manufacturer Bombardier describes what it calls the Global 8000. The Canadian company says the jet, which is still in the works, will be able to travel 8,000 nautical miles, hence the name. That's about 9,200 miles. To put it in perspective, a Boeing 747 has a range of about 8,800 miles. As far as speed, the new jet has a reported top speed of Mach 0.94, which is over 700 miles an hour. The plane is expected to enter service in 2025. It's one of many developments in the push to raise the speed of passenger aircraft. United Airlines said it could be offering supersonic routes as early as 2029. Still to come, Shen Yun Performing Arts has been touring all over the world for more than a decade. Audience members describe the performances as the spark in the dark. What makes this performance arts company so special? Find out more after the break. Now let's look at a classical Chinese dance performance. Audience members around the world say Shen Yun brings hope and lifts their spirits, and some even said they felt healed in some way. Let's take a look. Today, with the division and chaos in the world, many may feel hopelessness or despair. But some have found peace and hope in an unexpected place. 
see I'm half Ukrainian. So right now I'm very worried about the Ukraine, but this gives me hope. Happy, very happy. It, it um, goes straight to your soul. You know, you just, you feel it inside the whole time. And I felt like I was in heaven for some of it. We need that divine and it's just so impactful. Shen Yun Performing Arts has been touring all over the world for over a decade. No matter what situation or wherever they go, audiences have described the performances as the spark in the dark. You come away from it with, uh, with a very wonderful feeling, uh, a lot about the hope of the future. And it kind of like relaxes our mind and calms our spirit amidst all the turmoil, amidst all the pandemic and the war going on in Europe right now. So it's like a breath of fresh air. That you just feel happy because it's a lot of messages that probably in these new days we have forgotten. You know, it's just peace, hope, and that there's still a beautiful world out there. Based in New York, Shen Yun draws top artists from around the world inspired by a shared mission, reviving traditional Chinese culture through the arts. But it goes deeper than just creating a beautiful display. The current affairs, uh, seeing something like this, which is the message is so positive, the compassion, and I think it's very valuable. Uh, it was valuable yesterday, today, and it will be it will still make sense tomorrow and it's, it's, it's incredibly important. For thousands of years, classical Chinese dance was used to express traditional values like a reverence for the heavens, emphasizing virtue, and the belief that good is rewarded and evil is punished. To do that, artists look to the divine for inspiration. They believe that to create art that uplifts, one had to go through a process of purification, which is referred to as self-cultivation. Today, Shen Yun's artists follow this noble tradition. According to Shen Yun's website, alongside their rigorous training, the artists meditate together and require of themselves self-discipline and selflessness. The company says this is one of the reasons why audience members feel there is something different about Shen Yun. Just the minute I sat down, I could feel like something divine in the room, something present. Um, I, I really would say I could feel God in the room. That has a certain sense of spirituality and emotional calmness that I think only something like meditation could give you. The biggest thing I got was divine, creation, creator and the importance of hope in remembering where we come from as a people, as a human race. NTD has covered Shen Yun since its inception as it believes the company's mission is culturally historic. Audience members around the world describe the performance as rejuvenating and even healing. The whole thing was healing, really. I used walking sticks to have Parkinson's disease, you know. I had trouble getting in here and after the show I walked right up out of there. I don't know what happened. <laughs> The show kept our emotions elevated. It was like we were leading a little bit to heaven. Perfection, divine, 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 or that word. My whole body's cells trembled, and for a moment, it was as if we received some kind of soothing emotion that gently caressed like soft cotton, making people instantly comfortable and relaxed, feeling good. Oh, I feel just transformed. I think it was just something that so... Uh, powerful so that you can experience a, such a great elevation of feeling. It made me feel that there's hope and that we're back to some semblance of being normal again. It's so lifting and uh, the love that is shared and telling their stories, um, there's nothing like it. It's worth coming every night to see the same performance. If someone wants to experience truth and beauty and spirituality and be totally engaged by it, transformed by it, um, mesmerized by it, inspired by it, come to this performance. NTD News, New York. Thank you so much for joining us. We're going to put our email address on screen. We'd love to hear from you. For podcasters, that's news.today at ntd.com. Until next time, Kevin Hogan, NTD News, New York City.
Hello, I'm. Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.